marvelous. Okay, it's 7.02 and I'm gonna just get rolling. I'm gonna keep letting people in the room, but we all wanna hear what John Elliott has to show and say. So um, my name is Jody. I'm an adult services associate at Addison Public Library. This is my program guide. I am so proud of what I've put together for all of you. Um, this week has been a, a triple header. Uh, we had a rain barrels program and we had a power vegetable gardening program. And finally, the big kahuna, the Chicago Audubon Spring Migration Program. So um, I welcome John Elliott to introduce himself. He will always give a better bio than I could. So I'll let him tell you about himself. And uh, John, whenever you're comfortable with sharing your slides, go right ahead. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jody. Um, oh I don't sir. like to do too much introduction. I guess it's sort of, sort of useful to have uh, some idea that the person that's giving a pro program knows what they're talking about. So I would just say that I was the uh, an interpretive naturalist for the Cook County Forest Preserves for many years and ended my career there the last few years supervising the six nature centers education programs for the Forest Preserve District. And then along the way, basically was uh, tried to be the kind of the old school naturalist, a little bit of everything, probably not really an expert on anything. But of course, birds are one of my favorite things I've been fascinated with. And since I've retired some years ago, I've had more time to go out and chase around and look for birds, but I won't get too much into my thoughts about chasing birds and, and all of that kind of stuff. You can ask me about that if you'd like. I do lead some uh, walks in the behalf of the Chicago Audubon Society and as a volunteer for the Cook County Forest Preserves. You can check out websites, so you'll have them up um, later on in the program where you can find that kind of information for Chicago Audubon and you can always go to the forest preserves. I do my volunteer walks at Trailside Museum and River Forest. And uh, generally, because we do have limits on how many people we take on bird walks and especially now with COVID restrictions are a little less than we have had in the past. They generally fill up fairly quickly. So if you do get online, you see one that you'd like to participate in, you wanna register fairly early on them. Uh, so, with that, um, migration. What is migration? Uh, let me share my screen. We'll see, make sure this is working. Let's see. I want to share my application. So uh, somebody told me if that's not working. I don't think so. Yeah, not that I heard it. Yeah. I'll look at the other It's great. It's great. Okay. So migration. Let's get Not in. Migration. Um, what Boy, is no. migration? Well, it's um, something that we would think we'd know quite a bit about, but it's something that has evolved in many different species in many different ways. Um, and uh, if I was in front of you live, which I would like to be, but I'm not, I would ask for some responses about what you think migration is. But there are many mysteries about it as much as we studied and know about it. So we'll talk a little bit about who, why, where, when, and of course, how migration happens. So when you, maybe if you're uh, into bird migration, you might wanna go down to the Illinois River Valley and um, usually in the fall, winter, when the snow geese come in in huge numbers, they nest up farther north. And you can see flocks of thousands of them sometimes. And um, how do they get there? What are they doing? How do they know to get to where they're going? Um, it's all very puzzling. We should try to get some kind of a definition of migration though. And, and so here's a rather comp long my, uh, definition which you can read, I'll read for in case you can't read it very well, a journey with a clear purpose from one area or region to another, often following a well-defined route to a familiar destination and often at a specific season or time. So key things in there is purpose from one area or region to another and often at a specific season or time. But notice there's too often in that definition, which means that there are times when that's not the case, that the migration doesn't necessarily follow 
with that exactly. So who does migrate? Let's take a look for a moment, perhaps, to human beings. Um, human beings have been migrants. We know, probably most of us know, what we call snowbirds, who uh, this part of the world, they like to get away from the harsh winters in the north and go somewhere south, Arizona or Florida, for sometimes as much as half the year. So does that fit the definition of migration that we saw? Well, it's a clear purpose. It's from one area region to another. It's usually a well-defined route to a familiar destination in a specific season. So I'd say, yes, those people fit our definition of migrants. People have been migrating, of course, for a long time before that. Um, there are still a few people around the world who uh, follow a nomadic lifestyle. I don't know, I kind of would have thought without before I started paying much attention to this that if I said, if you heard nomad, it would be sort of like wandering. And wandering is not the same thing. Wandering is sort of purposeless. It may have a purpose, but it doesn't have the clear destination. It's not necessarily specific to a particular area. So there are migrants, people who live that way, not as retirees who have the wherewithal and the ability to indulge themselves, but people who travel around their particular part of the world. And that would be um, like animals, other creatures that migrate in search of the necessities for survival, looking for the resources that they need to, to survive and finding them in different seasons at different places. And that's one of the keys to migration amongst most creatures. If you are going to migrate, we would talk a lot about birds and um, but with a lot of the creatures that migrate, the animals, birds especially, it's particularly um, to find more profitable nesting seasons and, win and wintering uh, grounds. So sandhill cranes are um, very prominent migrants through the Midwest. We can, we're in a flyway where birds that winter farther south down on the Gulf Coast and farther south will stage on the way north to nesting grounds up through Wisconsin and farther north. And there's a staging ground down at Jasper Pulaski Preserve wildlife uh, area in Northwest Indiana where they'll stage over. And then they'll get to somewhere where they could nest. One of the good news stories amongst a lot of bad news stories out there, unfortunately, with wildlife is sandhill crane numbers have increased dramatically over the last uh, couple of decades. And we do have sandhill cranes nesting now in our area. This picture down here at the bottom was a pair with a colt up at Crabtree Nature Center in the Barrington area a couple of years ago. So basically with a lot of the birds and other creatures is to, to have profitable feeding and wintering areas and um, more profitable um, nesting areas. And it's, it's fraught with danger. It's, a, it's an interesting question of how it has evolved. We won't take much time to talk about that. For a long time, people had no idea really what migration was about. And lots of fantastic stories evolved with uh, birds that came out of pods and trees that uh, wintered in the oceans and they were caught in fish. Um, people that actually thought that some birds might fly to the moon, um, which is an aside uh, that we can actually learn about migration by watching full moon through a scope because you can actually see birds passing across the face of the moon, which is one of the ways we find out about migration. Other ways we learn about bird migration in particular is banding studies, um, bird banding. There's actually gonna be a bird banding demonstration at Trailside Museum coming up on their May program list if you're interested in that. Uh, I don't have the information in front of me at the moment. I digress. Um, so uh, as people began to learn more about migration, one of the things they found, one of the fun stories was is in Europe when the uh, large birds began to be tracked because we could see large birds. People could see where they were going and find that, okay, they were in Africa in the wintertime and they were in Europe in the summertime, like cranes. And what about small birds? Could they fly long distances like that? People doubted that sometimes. And there was one story that uh, birds like swallows hitched rides on the back of the cranes for their migration, all of which we know isn't true. But if you're going to go somewhere, what do you need? You need to be able to find your way. You need probably, you and I, we would need a map of some sort, paper map in the old days, GPS nowadays, um, a compass perhaps, uh, route finding of some sort. You need to have um, some sense of time. 
you need to have a place, sense of place. Um, so for an animal, a bird or another animal, how do they do this? Do they carry maps? No, they don't. They must have that built into their brains in some sense or another. They, you know, some kind of internal clock, some kind of sense of time of when it's the right time to migrate in season, how far to go, how fast do they travel, how many days, all of those things. is a lot of study been done, but an awful lot we just don't know about how that all works yet. So I just find really, really interesting. What else you need is you need to have reserves. You need to be able to have the resources to get there. If you're going to travel, you're going to either pack a good uh, supply of food and beverage, or you're going to have planned out places where you can stop and do that. And animals do both. They uh, pack in fat reserves before they take off on their journeys, but they also oftentimes will find resting places along the way. We'll talk about that just a little bit more in a bit. So many of that is a puzzle. Also, how much of this is learned behavior and how much of is it is innate, inherited? Uh, that's also a big puzzle because a lot of creatures, the young, uh, some young birds, some uh, insects, the young ones uh, migrate without ever having any instruction whatsoever from any kind of parents. So how that all works is oftentimes a bit of a puzzle. Um, Monarch butterflies, we talk a little bit about some of the creatures other than birds that migrate here for a little bit, uh, are classic of migrants. And of course, monarch butterflies, we're concerned about them right now because their numbers have been declining dramatically. And that's probably not so much due to the migration, but due to both conditions on both the summer grounds up in the United States and on wintering grounds, mostly in Mexico. Uh, I wanted to uh, read just a little bit about migrant, mo mo uh, excuse me, monarchs from um, a fellow named Bob Hughes, who's a big uh, birder in DuPage, Bob Fisher, I'm sorry, get my Bobs mixed up, DuPage County birder. And they do, the bird club of DuPage County does hawk watches at Green Valley Preserve. And I'll mention that a little bit later in the references. But one day as on September, Friday, September 7th, 2018, Bob Fisher wrote this report for three hours under the heavy overcast above the landfill at Green Valley, we watched a steady stream of monarch butterflies being rapidly swept southwest by the wind. Our estimates suggested 20 to 50 passing over the hill per minute during a three hour period. Most were a couple of hundred feet up doing very little wing flapping, just coasting along in the breeze. So that's just, um, and he estimated that there were five to 10,000 monarchs went by in his three hour uh, watching. And we don't see that so much, even in the few years since then, the numbers have declined dramatically. And I just want to do another segue here or a sidetrack is that we do encourage people to plant milkweeds and other flowers. Milkweeds are the plants that the monarchs need to lay their eggs on and their larvae to develop, but they use, adults use many other kinds of flowers like the goldenrods and the asters in these pictures and all of which you can grow in your yards. And that's a place where you can make a difference even in a very small yard. So there's my soapbox plug for that for a moment. And just as a pitch, there are the planting for nat native plants for uh, monarchs and other insects, bees. Uh, this is a, a kind of a sphinx moth over here on a, on a milkweed at the bottom. Also helps the birds because um, the birds depend on the insects that live on the flowers and plants in, in their resting in. Uh, nesting areas, and we can help that out by planting those native plants that um, host the insects that host the birds. Another migrant uh, insect is a common green darner dragonfly. These are the real common, very large dragonflies that we see regularly all around ponds and streams, and sometimes out in the fields and over park fields uh, throughout the summer. And they uh, there's a pair in mating flight. <clears throat> they, uh, like all dragonflies and damselflies, they lay their eggs in water and then the, the uh, nymphs develop in the water. And some of the common green, green dra uh, uh, dragons that we see around here behave like most of our other dragonflies that they lay their eggs in the spring 
and <clears throat> the nymphs develop in the summer, the adults come out and lay eggs again and then uh, overwinter that way. But a large number of uh, green darners do migrate and there's a very large number of them that have been tracked in um, the adults in the fall fly to uh, winter in Mexico and the Caribbean where they undergo another life cycle where the young hatch out from those nesting areas and then those adults come back. How do they know, like the monarchs, how do they know to come back? We have no idea how they make that journey. One more dragonfly. This is probably, some people say, is the champion migrant of all creatures. This is a wandering glider and it's well named. This was taken, photo taken by my buddy here in the Chicago area. And this uh, colored uh, zones on this map are the range of wandering glider dragonflies. They're throughout the, the uh, most of the southern hemisphere and much of the northern hemisphere, short of the, the Arctic zones. And not only are they found throughout these areas, but some of them travel widely amongst these wide ranging uh, uh, resident areas. And I know nothing about how that evolved. How migration evolved, I digress for a moment anyway, is a real puzzle because it is a very risky behavior. It entails a lot of risks and yet the benefits have to outweigh the risks or they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do it that way. Mammals migrate in, in the Americas. We don't have as many as in say Africa, for example, but the uh, caribou in the um, north of Alaska and Canada, woodland caribou are classic mammal migrants. They um, spend the summer raising their young right up against the Arctic Ocean, that dark pink area up there at the top of the, of the map. And then there's uh, other nesting areas. You can't read the legend over there and I've kind of forgotten what it says. But that is great for raising their young. It's up on the ocean where the mosquitoes aren't, the bugs aren't so bad. There's food in that short Arctic summer up there that they can use, but that's much too harsh an environment for them in the winter time. So they migrate south into the uh, edge of the wooded zones, the uh, tundra, the uh, Arctic boreal forests in the winter time and then back again every summer. Bats are other uh, mammal migrants that we have in North America. Most of our bats that we might find around here, little brown bats, probably the most common, Cory bat's another one that's found in this area. They find places to winter where they can be well protected and in, in, often in large colonies. And they may not migrate very far. Many of them just go to uh, large colonies in caves uh, in southern Indiana, down into Missouri, and farther south into the Appalachian area. Hey, John, your mic is off. Closed in the springtime because snakes migrate, for, migrate from the rocky bluffs where they've overwintered in crevices in the bluffs down into the marshland that you see off to the left side of the picture. And um, these pictures are credited to the Southern, which is a newspaper down in that Southern Illinois area. You can look that up and go down there and take a look. Meanwhile, uh, amphibians, many of our amphibians, uh, overwinter in the ponds where they live or nearby, but things like toads and salamanders, many of the salamanders spend much of their lives on dry land and migrate very, very short distance to, to lay their eggs in the water where as amphibians, they have to be in the water, the eggs have to be in the water. Um, one of the champion migrants of all creatures is leatherback turtles. This is a scrawling map of migrant areas, but over there on the Asian uh, subtropic, tropical and subtropical Asian beaches is where most of they lay their eggs, but they spend much of the rest of the year traveling all the way across the Pacific Ocean and back, feeding up against the Pacific coast of the United States and other areas. There's another smaller migration group down there in Central and South America. And let's see, I'll find the number here. 
uh, <clears throat> leatherback turtle amongst turtles is the record holder traveling an astounding, it says here, 10,000 miles or more each year in search of jellyfish that's being Oh, yeah, we have a picture of the turtle on a beach to nest. So we're going to um, birds a little bit more. Birds are some, as a group, as a, as a taxa, are the migrant champions because there are more birds that migrate. I guess I never bothered to look up any numbers, but I would guess that the majority of the birds that we see in the Chicago area are migrants. Not that many are uh, permanent residents. We could rattle off a few cardinals, chickadees, things like that, that were very common around our feeders and in the wintertime in our yards. But most of our summer nesting birds migrate from farther south and many of our overwintering birds migrate from farther north. And migrant groups uh, include almost all groups of birds has some, at least some of them are migrants like the shorebirds. I think these are avocets, I believe in that picture in California. Um, the uh, all, all parts of a bird are designed for efficient flight. And you can pick up a book and take a look at the body structure of a bird and you get the idea. They have hollow bones, very lightweight hollow bones. Their uh, lungs are very, very well developed. Their metabolism is such that they, uh, they can burn their uh, food very efficiently. They can store fat very efficiently. The feathers are designed for flight, of course, all designed to make efficient flight. And of course, flight is what's required to make long distance migration for a bird. So just a few superlatives just for fun, uh, as best we know, the longest round trip, uh, 25,000 miles back and forth from one end of the uh, uh, Arctic to the Antarctic every year. And a bird might live several years and make that trip a number of times. The longest flight without feeding, this has been done by uh, satellite tracking to discover that this is really true. The bar-tailed godwit can fly up to well over 7,000 miles in one flight without feeding. They nest up in the Arctic and they uh, overwinter mostly down on the coast of China and Asia. Bar-headed geese fly over the Himalayas from their nesting zones in Siberia to their wintering areas down um, on the Indian Ocean, five and a half miles high to get over. There's not much air up there. <laughs> There's not much oxygen. And yet they, these birds, these big birds do this over and over and over again. Amongst birds, the shortest migration that I was able to find was a blue grouse. They live out uh, in the mountains and like in the Olympic National Park area, they, um, let's see, what is it? They, they uh, use the, uh, I don't have that written down here, I'm sorry. They, they uh, winter in the uh, conifer forests where it's warmer in the wintertime and they migrate uphill a little bit to the de deciduous forests in the summertime. I think that's right, maybe it's the other way around, but it's conifer to deciduous, less than a um, half a mile. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are common hummingbirds of the east. Travel 500 miles across the Gulf of Mexico without stopping. And some migration shows are just absolutely spectacular. Um, this is a collection that the uh, photograph you, if you're a good birder, you know, you could, you could figure out what these birds are in this by their silhouettes, but it says, because I'm not quite that good, I can recognize some of them broad winged hawks, Swainson's hawks, and turkey vultures. You can pick out the turkey vultures. They're the big broad winged ones. Um, these are over Veracruz along the Mexican coast where they concentrate uh, as they move uh, north in the springtime. And I think spring and fall, both, I think as I recall spring is a better time to see them in the large numbers. And sometimes you can see those uh, larger numbers here. Um, this is a picture of uh, from Mexico, uh, mostly broad wings in this uh, hawks in this picture. Uh, there's a few turkey vultures in there, broad wings and turkey vultures in that picture. But sometimes you'll see kettles, they're called uh, the hawks overhead, of um, broad winged hawks in numbers of 30 to 40 at a time. I've never seen any quite that many, 
hawk watch, as I mentioned, that the uh, monarch story came from a hawk watch. People like in migration season to go find usually higher points with a lot of view around. So Green Valley Forest Preserve and Southern DuPage County, there's that, uh, that hill out there that's actually a, a garbage dump. But in selected times, you can go up there and watch the hawks migrate because you've got a great view from a long distance. There are other places around where people do that up in Lake County, Illinois, at Illinois Beach State Park, there's people who have been doing the hawk watches there for years. This is sandhill cranes. Again, I mentioned the sandhill cranes before because they're the ones that we're most likely to see in fairly large spectacular flocks close to home. I've seen as many as 2,000 in a short period of time flying over the area. Where I live in Oak Park, I don't see the large flocks very often. If you're out there in DuPage County, you're more likely to see the large flocks migrating over. They tend to go just a little bit farther west from where I live, so maybe you're lucky. When I've seen the large numbers, they've been out like in the Palos Forest Preserves and places like that. And again, I mentioned that Jasper Pulaski site uh, where they stage, call they, they rest over sometimes for some days or even a few weeks, both in spring and fall, but especially in fall they'll concentrate in big numbers on this field. And the uh, state of Indiana Department of Natural Resources has set up a observation area there. I went down there with uh, first time when I was new to Chicago area in the late seventies. And oh, it was a great show. And my wife and I were the only ones there watching it. <laughs> and we went back about 15 years later and there was a little viewing platform had been set up and there was a small group of people and then we went back a few years later and the viewing platform is Hold tight everybody we're going to just let John's computer resolve if you've uh, really into birding you might have seen the movie or read the book the big year and Hey John I, yes Oh, your computer froze for a second. You were talking about how you came the last time to the birding platform or the viewing platform. What did you say about that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, what I said was that there are hundreds of people now come down there to watch 10 to 20,000 cranes at a time. Oh, my. Does that cover it? Yes, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you... Uh, the big year, that's a whole nother story about chasing birds that I don't want to get into this evening, but they talk about a fallout. Fallouts are famous events where weather conditions are such that migrant birds are forced down by uh, usually by harsh weather in huge numbers. This is extremely unusual. This is a photograph uh, that I got from Smithsonian about a fallout on the Texas coast where they're really, really, uh, this phenomenon really happens dramatically. It happens here, but when it happens here, you won't see huge numbers. You'll just see more birds than typically uh, on the ground, oftentimes feeding rather desperately. It's kind of sad for them, good for birders because they are so hungry and knocked down by uh, the bad weather. And uh, this particular story here was from 2013 and uh, people felt so sorry for the birds that they were brought out food. And this is a whole bunch, mostly Orioles, um, some kind of tanager there in the foreground of the picture. Uh, people brought out uh, food for the migrants uh, that, that fell down, uh, were dropped down by the weather. They've had to fight the weather, the wind. Many of them don't make it, they don't get to land. They're coming across the Gulf Coast in this particular case. And if they uh, get hit by a cold front and harsh weather, they may not have enough energy to make it. So this is a video that shows, this is from Lake Erie, and as you watch this, you're watching birds, the blue, on radar. When you see weather radar on TV, they, they edit out the birds and the bugs and all the other stuff that the radar can pick up shows the weather. But in this case, they left the birds on there and show the storm front coming through. And you can see how it's starting over again now. You can see how was the birds are being caught on radar as they're coming up towards Lake Erie, and the cold front comes through and it just knocks them down. You can see the numbers of uh, the birds in, in the air just totally, almost totally go away. 
So you go there in the spring in particular to McGee Marsh. And it's the, the big year, the greatest, the greatest event in North American birding, some people say. Other people, of course, will argue. This is the parking lot when I went out a few years ago in May, usually about the second week of May, which is about the time our bird uh, migration here peaks because we're on the same latitude as they are. And um, we found, we were looking, we were watching when we were there, uh, license plates from almost every state in the country were there to uh, watch this spectacular bird show. And this is kind of what it looks like. This is a less crowded view of the boardwalk that you can walk along there and see the birds. And it's just a fabulous place to see a lot of the same kind of migrants for the most part that we see around here. Uh, some differences in numbers quite because of the, them being that much farther east. But it's a great place to see and take pictures. Even I could take good pictures of warblers in a place like that. So these are birds we could see here. This is a Blackburnian warbler male in the spring plumage. It's a Cape May. And um, not just warblers, this is a scarlet tanager that we saw there at, uh, in the McGee Marsh here. And it's not just the McGee Marsh itself, but several other preserves. There's nearby wildlife refuges where uh, shorebirds are uh, coming down in numbers. I think these were Dunlins, one of the sandpipers. And um, these are fallow ropes that you can find in other places. There's woodlands, there's the lakefront there where the McGee Marsh parking area is, uh, and the marshes, just a terrific place to go and spend a few days if you have the time. So about migration in the Chicago area, um, this is a great view of our lovely city as we are along the shore of Lake Michigan. And birds, of course, they migrate north and south and they look for corridors, they look for pathways that are appropriate for them. And if they're flying north through the farm country and the rural areas downstate Illinois, they come to Lake Michigan and they don't like to fly across Lake Michigan. So they'll either go up the Michigan side or the Illinois side of the lake. And if they happen to be at, um, and most of this migration of small birds does happen at night. And the, uh, if they come along the lake, and they hit Chicago at night at, at daybreak when it's time for them to rest. They are desperately looking for some place to rest. And that's why our lakefront parks are so important and also why the corridors along our north-south accidentally by geology are major streams. The Des Plaines River, the North Branch of the Chicago River, Salt Creek, the DuPage River, all flow north to south. So we do have parks and preserves along those stream corridors that make great migration stopover points for birds. But of course, the hazard is windows and glass. And uh, this is a, a picture from um, Ottawa, um, Toronto, I think, Canada's Ottawa wing, uh, maybe it's in Ottawa, um, of dead birds that were picked up uh, from um, one uh, building that had hit the building and, and died. Now in Chicago, we have the Chicago bird collision monitors that go out and rescue. A lot of the birds that hit windows that get confused by the lights especially will um, survive and they can be rescued and picked up. And the ones that don't survive, they go to the field museum for study collections. And that's been a great help to the ornithologist, unfortunate for the birds. So we have places like Montrose Beach and Point that are just absolutely terrific places to go birding because the parks along the lake are just great dropout points, resting points for the birds. And not just the migrants, we have resident peregrines that uh, hang out out there at Montrose as well. Most peregrines are not, peregrines are not migrants, they're not very long distance migrants anyway. They may move around some, but they don't fit that definition that we gave of what migrants are. Other birds that you can see along the lakefront, uh, long-tailed ducks, which are migrant ducks, like most water, almost all waterfowl is migrant, except of course our local resident Canada geese and some of our mallards. But that's kind of an artifact of human intervention. That's not really something that they uh, evolved on their own. We kind of taught them that, giving them the space to take and survive in the wintertime so they don't bother to migrate. Long-tailed ducks are just really cool. Um, they're one of the more unusual kinds of waterfowl, but many, many species of waterfowl can be found, especially along the lake, but also on inland ponds and lakes at this season. We're already past the uh, 
waterfowl migration peak this year. The ducks have mostly gone on to their nesting season. There's still a few around, but not so many. If you want to follow a lot of this stuff, eBird is a really great source. I'm not going to try to get into this too much, but they you can go there and really study these uh, um, migration patterns as well as other things about birds. Here's two of our warblers that come through this area um, and don't typically nest here. You can see the nesting area is in brown and the uh, wintering area in blue and uh, just shows the difference about how far birds migrate. Why don't Cape May warblers, which have very, very similar nesting requirements as to northern water thrushes, go farther up into Alaska because their wintering grounds are farther south and it just may be too far. The eBird is a place where you can enter your own observations, encourage people to do that because uh, then uh, the accumulation of records is allow scientists to do a lot of these studies along with uh, Christmas counts, spring counts, and other so-called citizen science efforts that help the ornithologists, scientists um, study these, these phenomena. Mention some wintering birds here. Uh, juncos, the gray bird in the foreground, many of you may recognize those, are sparrows. They are not very closely related to the house sparrows, which are European. House sparrows are a group called weaver finches. We do not have any native weaver finches in America, but we do have lots and lots of native sparrows of which a junco is one kind. And uh, often we call them snowbirds because we only see them in the winter. The ones that we see in the winter here, uh, that spend the winter, most of the winter, nest pretty far north, typically. Uh, at this time of year, you'll be seeing juncos. I saw some in my yard around my feeder yet the last day or two. They are probably not the ones that wintered here. The ones that wintered here are probably already headed north, and the ones that we're seeing now are probably migrants on their way through. And you know, there's a whole long lot of study and a lot of speculation about how that works, which you can ask me more about later if you'd like. Robins are an interesting character. When I um, came, I moved to the Chicago area in the mid 70s and started work for the forest preserves, and it was pretty unusual to see a robin in the wintertime. So the old story about a first robin of spring was kind of pretty well true. Now it's very common to see robins sometimes in flocks of 40 or 50 in the wintertime as this picture was taken with snow on the ground. But the robins are engaged in a somewhat similar migration pattern as the juncos that the robins that we see here in the wintertime are probably birds that nested farther north. And the reason that's happening is that they weren't nesting farther north in the mid 70s they have started to move, they have moved nesting areas dramatically farther north over the last decades. And the birds that wintered here are probably gone, and the robins that we're seeing now are probably the migrants from farther south, more the traditional ones that we've always seen over the years here. If you look at the range maps, um, this is uh, from Cornell, um, all about birds at Cornell is another absolutely fabulous source for what you need to know. The range maps for a dark-eyed junco and an American robin are remarkably similar, um, except that you see the blue, the light blue, is only wintering, where uh, that range is mostly permanent resident, purple uh, color for the robins. And you can see the permanent residents in juncos in the United, continental United States are mostly in the mountain areas, some along the coast, a few up in northern Wisconsin. If we overlay a map from the 70s from a bird guide from the um, Zim Golden Birding Guide uh, range map of robins from the 70s and tagged along with it a sonogram, made that bird guide a terrific resource at the time, still is. But you can see the differences in the range from the bird guide in the 70s to one recent one and how much farther north the range, nesting range of robins has extended and the overwintering range has extended much farther north in the time that those two public were published. And you can see that in Christmas count numbers, almost very, very few in, in from 1970 up until, um, oh, I guess that would be about 2000 or late 90s. Um, that's not the year um, that you see there on the bottom. It's the number of Christmas counts, which is one, one year off. Um, the year is one year different than the, the count number. And all of a sudden there was this big spike. And it's not every winter, but most winters. 
So some of the other migrants we'd be looking for right now as they're headed back, um, hermit thrush up there in the upper picture is a small thrush related, robins or thrushes related. Um, I have not seen a hermit thrush yet this year, which I'm kind of nervous because I usually see those fairly early in the migration season. Maybe just haven't found one yet. And then the bluebird down there at the bottom, this would be a nesting bluebird, probably taking a, a worm, a nice and juicy worm off to a nestling. Um, and bluebirds also now have started to overwinter here, but not in numbers like the robins. Of course, we don't have bluebirds in numbers like we have robins. Uh, shorebirds uh, and waterfowl, uh, pelicans back there in the background of this picture. We can now, something we never ever saw in the immediate Chicago area until the last few years is migrant pelicans, pelicans in this area. Now, sometimes people see them 150 to 200 at a time at some of the lakes um, around uh, Palos area, out in DuPage County and up in Lake County, along with a variety there of other shorebirds sandpipers, phalaropes, and things like that. Uh, there's a, another bunch of those and move on. Some of our other raptors um, mentioned the hawks that are many of which are migrants. Red-tailed hawks are permanent residents. American kestrels are permanent residents. Uh, many of our other hawks are migrants, come here only in the summertime or like rough-legged hawks are wintering birds here and go back farther north to nest. We have uh, two fairly common well, I, well, more common than you think. They're kind of hard to find, but they're out there. Owls we see only in the winter. The little sawwet owl, which is not much bigger than a uh, than a sparrow. They're about, uh, I guess, about cardinal size or chubbier. And um, some numbers of them sometimes winter here. And long-eared owls um, are sporadic. We don't see them in numbers every year, but many winters we do see them. Short-eared owls are another one that we see mostly in this area in the wintertime in grassland areas or fields. Snowy owls are a little bit different. Snowy owls are not true migrants. They um, come in what are called eruption years. That's spelled with an I, I-R-R-U. Um, and it seems to be triggered. They nest uh, up in the Arctic on the tundra. And in the wintertime, they turn mostly white as great camouflage. And they're used to being out in the open because there is very little cover up there. So when they do come down here, they're usually pretty easy to see. These are both along the lakefront. Um, the one there with the crows nearby was at Northerly Island. The other one was down by McCormick Place. And they will sit out and they're pretty tame and pretty calm. And they, these crows, they did, the bird just didn't bother, they didn't bother the owl at all. There were a whole bunch of crows around calling and these three bold ones got close, but didn't bother them. But they uh, respond to, um, mostly it's a response to the success of breeding in the previous year. It's not, well, oftentimes people thought, well, we get eruption years of snowy owls when food is short in the Arctic. And that may be a factor, but it's mostly that if they've had very, very good breeding success, a lot of the young birds will be kind of driven off of the territories of the adults. And they're the ones for the most part that will end up much farther south in the winter time. So uh, a little bit more on our spring migrants as time is uh, going through. I've begun to see quite a few number of these kinglets. Kinglets are about the size of chickadees. There's two species, golden crowns and ruby crowns. Um, and you, if you know where chickadees hang out in migration season, go and watch the chickadees because the kinglets will often go find the chickadees because the chickadees know where the food is. And uh, also there's uh, safety in numbers. Chickadees are great alarm call birds. They warn of predators and other threats to uh, other species of birds. Uh, yellow rump warblers are the most common of our migrant warblers. They come in different plumages. There's a full um, breeding plumage adult male at the top. There's a slightly paler male down there at the bottom where you can really kind of see the yellow rump patch. A female there on the lower right, they all have the yellow on the rump regardless of the rest of their plumage uh, characteristics. I've been starting to see yellow rump warblers just now within the last week for this season's migration. And another very, very common migrant warbler here is palm warbler. Um, the second most common, probably sometimes more abundant even than yellow rumps in migration. And then there's a whole host of warblers, 35 species more 
that we might see, a few of which do stay here to nest, not very many, but a couple uh, that you might see. Um, so we have Cape May warbler as one of the more colorful, more unusual ones. Really love that picture of the one giving me the eye there from the branch over in Columbus Park near my house. So as I said, it's, it's spring, it's migration time. The birds are gonna fly. They do fly, get out there and see them while you can. Um, I can um, give you this, uh, I can give Jody this slide as a reference, uh, as a PDF. Uh, if you want, this is some of the web references that I used uh, to put this together. This uh, eBird or the select the animations page at eBird and some of the stuff on Cornell, those are just really fascinating. There's all kinds of animations of migration on, on there. Um, and a um, couple of the books that I used and my uh, email address, if you want to get in touch with me by email, jot that down real quick or we could put it in the chat. And then one more page of uh, references, places local organizations for the most part, the Chicago Audubon, of course, DuPage Bird Club for you folks out there is a terrific organization. They do all kinds of trips and programs throughout the year. Like most of us, they've been doing most of their programming virtually, but they are doing uh, real live bird walks again, but they do caution that they fill up very, very quickly. So, uh, but they do have pages on where to bird in DuPage County. Chicago Audubon Society has pages on where to bird in the immediate Chicago area. Um, Chicago Ornithological Society also welcomes people from all over. Illinois Audubon Society. Audubon Societies, by the way, anybody can use the name. So just because it says Audubon Society doesn't mean we're all part of the same organization. Though Chicago Audubon Society is the local chapter of the National Audubon Society, but Illinois Audubon and other local Audubons are not. And then it's all about birds. If you want identification information, you want sounds, music, videos, uh, all kinds of stuff. And they also run the ebird.org site. So with that, no, I didn't talk too terribly long, a little bit over. Oh, so, you're, you're doing great. Yeah, so, you're right um, on time. I'm going to stop share. I hope, yes, okay. All right. And we can take some questions or comments if we have any. We sure can. So uh, I'm just gonna go to the top of the list to you know the very oldest comment. And uh, the first thing somebody asked right away was, did you say the birds were snow geese? Yeah, that one picture of the big flock. Snow goose is, uh, it, it, the, I'll digress again a little bit. Snow goose is another bird that's a huge success story that their numbers have increased dramatically over the last 20 years or so and to the fact of the point where they've become kind of disruptive to some other species of birds have taken over nest areas. But yeah, it's a, it's a species of goose. There are a number of species of goose. Canada goose, of course, is our more common one. Uh, we don't see snow geese in the immediate area here very often in migration. I have, but not often. That picture was taken down um, the lower Illinois River Valley at Chautauqua National Wildlife Refuge area, which is a good place to go and see waterfowl in season. Uh, many other species. We also, greater white-funded geese can be in some numbers down there. Um, other geese are much more unusual in this area. Okay, uh, other part of that question was, and where in the Illinois Fox Valley can they be found? Well, the snow geese, again, probably not, or not very often. Um, other waterfowl, more common waterfowl, there's quite a list of 15, 18 species of ducks that are, you might see inland, like in the Fox Valley. Then there are others that you only would most likely see out in Lake Michigan that like deeper water. But in uh, any place up and down the Fox River for waterfowl, and whenever there's not ice on the river. Right. Uh, next comment was the, that their internal navigation is astonishing. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. And again, the, it's got to be a very complex thing. We don't really have people have come up with all kinds of theories of how it works. And none of them really fit the bill. So it almost surely is some combination and is probably different in different species of birds. But some sense magnetic fields, they use vision. 
They can, uh, they know star and sunlight. They can, some of them know polarized light. Um, some of them, a lot of them recognize stars. That's been proved by putting them in planetariums with these tracking devices on them to see which way they go, depending on which way the planetarium view is seen. Um, some, there's stories, possibly odor, uh, smell is used. So yeah, just, we don't, but we really don't know how it all works. And it is absolutely stunning, just unbelievable that they can do this. It is unbelievable. How do the how do the monarchs do it? Just, no kidding. Yeah, it, 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 yeah wow. <laughs> so uh, another person saying, you know, just loving those statistics of how far they travel. Um, you mentioned um, how far hummingbirds go without stopping, but how long can they be aloft? It depends a lot on the birds. I'm not sure of that 500 miles, how long that would take them. Um, they can fly pretty fast with a tailwind, mm -hmm. but it would have to be in the order of 24 hours or more, at least. Okay. And because some birds, they... like, like that godwit that flies you know, that long distance, I mean, that's days. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And they soar, you know. Well, some, yeah, they, they, yeah, that's the whole thing about the fallout, about the weather being so crucial, because they certainly know how to use favorable winds. And some birds soar, they, the large birds in particular can soar, they can get on up the cranes. You watch them when you see them getting up in the morning, they use updrafts off of warm weather, off warm, warm surfaces, where columns of warm air rise off of parking lots or other warm surfaces, and they'll get in those columns of rising air and circle around and gain altitude as they, as they, uh, as long as they can, and then they'll glide off on either north or south again until they find another thermal that they can use. But little birds really can't soar. Uh, right. Small songbirds, they can't do that. So. Uh, that marsh that you visited, uh, how do you pronounce the name, Mad Maggie? Maggie, M-A-G-E. Yeah, Maggie Marsh. That's in Ohio? Yeah, it's near Toledo. It's um, west of Toledo. Just west of Toledo. No, east of Toledo. I can't remember. It's east of Toledo. Toledo Around Toledo. <laughs> Just east of Toledo. Okay, on another uh Bent, uh, is morning the best time to spot birds in any season? E yes and no. Yeah, in nesting season, absolutely for sure. By, by all means, the earlier the better. Dawn chorus is just one of the greatest things in the world. A lot of birds start to, we were, Jody and I were chatting about the robin singing at 2.30 and 3.30 in the morning. But if you're out camping or if you can get outside well before sunup, when it's still relatively quiet and then just park yourself somewhere where you know there's going to be birds and just listen to the chorus start up it's absolutely amazing and um, but in migration time also it's usually pretty good because the small birds that migrate mostly at night will if they find a good place they'll be feeding vigorously when they first come down and then they'll kind of hide out and rest and store up energy during the rest of the day and then may pick up movement again a little bit towards dusk. So dawn and dusk are generally the best times. Yeah, uh, yes. I'm a, you mentioned DuPage Birding Club. I uh, had them present last year and it was great. Uh, of course, the funny takeaway was the LBB, the little brown bird. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, that's, that's a joke, everybody. It's like, you know, when you don't know what a bird was and you want to describe it to, you know, a bird or yeah. you describe it as there, there's this little brown bird. So anyways, um, but, but in my backyard birding experience, it's amazing at dusk or like late in the afternoon in the summertime, like when it's before it's like crazy hot, uh, like four or five o'clock, it's just like action in my yard. Like I got the bath going, I got the different feeders going and all kinds are showing up. My favorite thing in that season, late in summer into early fall is when the chimney swifts start flying and the night hawks come around and they sit out in my backyard or on my deck and watch the chimney swifts going over. And they're these little, some people call them like flying cigars. They're, they're small birds, it's about six inches long, maybe eight. And a uh, kind of tubular body with a little bit of an angled swept back, almost like a falcon-like wing. And they chitter, chitter chatter as they fly around. I was, yeah, and they're up there uh, circling around catching insects up in, uh, at that time of, of night. Right, it's all about the bugs. Yeah. Uh, okay, another great question. Uh, a couple of years back, the Audubon Society gave lectures along the Chicago River Walk. Do you think that will ever be offered again? I don't know. 
Uh, that's a good question. I didn't, I, I've not, they, that was before I was with Audubon. Um, thank you for asking. I'm going to inquire about the other folks at Audubon. And thank you for pointing out that the Chicago Audubon is the official organization, national organization affiliate, and the others you can use the name. I had no idea you could actually just use the name. Yeah, and also, of course, um, there are national Audubon chapters throughout the Chicago region, and I can't think what the one out in DuPage County is, but there's a, a, a chapter of national Audubon in DuPage that covers DuPage County. Chicago Audubon, National Audubon has divided their chapters up by zip codes. And for some of us, it doesn't always make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> but yeah. Chicago Audubon has all of the Chicago and much of the west and southwest suburbs and some of the near north suburbs. So, Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Another one. A uh, question in general, are you seeing more animal friendly policies in Chicago, such as bird deterrent glass than in the past? And what other policies would you like to see? Well, there is um, a very, there's been a big promotion for many years now, but cooperative thing between Chicago Audubon, Chicago Ornithological Society and other people of interest to get Chicago to pass a bird friendly birding ordinance. And that's uh, basically pretty much done. It doesn't have everything in it that we would have liked, but lights out is one of the important things. And lights out Chicago took off just as a volunteer thing for a lot of the building owners downtown. And that helped a lot. It's really helped a lot to prevent a lot of bird collisions. As far as the glass goes, yeah, glass is tough. Uh, there's various kinds of things that can be done. Um, I don't think any ordinances that are out there at all are requiring any kind of retrofit on existing buildings for glass, only for new construction. Mm -hmm. So that would be a goal to get something more positive done there. I don't know how exactly that could work because yeah, there's a lot of difficulties. Otherwise, uh, main thing is just habitat preservation and native planting, more and more native plants because insects, insects are declining in tremendously and when the insects decline, the birds decline. So any place you can get native plants. Right, right. In, in I've yard, done programs. And parks and wherever. Sorry, yeah, absolutely. In parks and in, in parkways, you know, in between roadways. Yeah. It's fascinating right. and, and definitely um, underappreciated in a way. But I think there's a lot of uh, heft, you know, building up with people being aware of planting native. So. You know, I had the gardener on uh, on Tuesday night and he's like, plant flowers in your garden, you know, have the pollinators right next to your vegetables. And I was like, yes, exactly. And insects are good because insects are the food chain, you know, it's, yeah. it's how it works. Um, okay, I've got another great question. Where do you fall on providing water sources for wild birds during, during frozen winter? Um, I, they're saying I've read literature that goes both ways, as have I. We've generally, as Audubon have said, it's a have encouraged it. I'm not sure um, what the negative would be of it. I'd have to check into that. Uh, it certainly is a way to attract birds, and they need water. And water, in when when all the water's frozen up, it's hard for them to come by. So I'm not sure. I'd have to look into what a negative on it would be. I've heard of that, like putting a heater in your in your bird bath. Yeah, yeah, well, that's the thing. If you're going to have the water out there, you either have to just replace it regularly or put a heater in it. Okay, okay. Uh, someone commenting, I saw a solitary common loon in Lake Zurich today. Oh, how cool. Yeah, you can get um, loons in some of the larger Indian, Indian lakes are pretty common, even sometimes in some of the small ones. I was twice... I've seen a common loon at the lagoon in Columbus Park oh. in my house, which is which really surprised me because that's a pretty small spot right there in the city. Um, but yeah, um, Saganashki Slough in Cook County and um, Mussy Lake. Uh, there's a park in Des Plaines that just for some reason attracts loons and they get red-throated loons there once in a while along with the common loons, so. I've had great success at Cricket Creek in Addison. For loons? And different, uh, for uh, different birds. Oh, for different, different birds, yeah. Yeah, not so much. I can't say that I've seen, it seems like so many of the birds you've, uh, you've shown tonight 
It's like, gosh, I wish I could see one of those. How will I ever get to? So, yeah, well, as far as the warblers go, you know, they're the kind of the 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 uh, holy grails of spring birding for hardcore birders because so many of them are so pretty and they come and go so fast. But just hang out in any forest preserve, any place, especially along the streams, and sooner or later you're going to see them. But that's the key, right? Is like be the, by the water, be by the um, habitat, habitat, the habitat. Bridge. Yeah, they got to have places to find food, to find shelter. And for sure. So. Okay, another person saying, I give architecture tours on the Chicago River and it's amazing how many birds I see. I've even seen a crane. Uh, other people thanking us for a fabulous presentation, thanking you, um, very interesting. Another one is, um, I've seen pictures of frozen dead birds from their wings being frozen. I don't know. My guess would be that something else killed them and then the wings appeared frozen. I, I, I don't know that just, I don't think their wings would freeze unless they got into water and couldn't get out or something. Right. But harsh weather, if they get wet, I and mean, feathers are really, really good at shedding water. But if they get overly wet and it's cold, just like we would, they could suffer. But I would guess that if it was frozen wings, it probably the freezing of the wings probably happened after the bird died. Don't know for sure, of course, but. Right. Uh, another great comment. It would be so beautiful to see various prairie plants along the expressways and tollways. Yeah, there are a few places where some, in Iowa, they've done a pretty good job of planting some some uh, expressways with prairie plants. There's a few places in Illinois, I think they've done it. Um, but yeah, reduce mowing on uh, right of ways would also help. You know. Yes. Um, another great question is how can people control weeds in a safe way for the birds? Uh, pull them. <laughs> yep. It depends on what kind of control you're talking about. If you're in your yard and your garden, you know, just a small plot, it's pretty easy. You can you can control, I mean, dandelions, some people like to poison their dandelions. I mean, I got nothing against dandelions myself, but, but I'm not a big fan of lawns. So, um, same. but yeah, it, it, I see people in my neighborhood out digging their dandelions, not using chemicals on them, digging them up, which is right. Hard. It's hard. Uh, the big question though, is with larger organizations, farmers, of course, agriculture is huge. And that's one of the big reasons for declining insects around the, the yes. world is agricultural practices. Yes, it is. So not so many roadsides and, and fence rows left to grow. And then the use of herbicides and insecticides that drift off of the crops. Uh, so, yeah. Right, it's not just about the, the use of the insecticide on the crop, it's about it blowing in the wind. Right, so, and of course there's rules and regulations about that, but they're very, very hard to, it's hard to monitor and hard to enforce. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, just somebody chiming in about using heated dog dishes, inexpensive heating dog dishes that you can find at the hardware store. Sure. Um, just hearing that the wings can freeze on birds, another comment about that, uh, when the air is below freezing, that their wings can freeze. I, I suppose know. if you had, I mean, I guess that would be a question about putting out the, the water, but I've seen birds in natural conditions bathing in cold weather and freezing weather out there dunking themselves in the water. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. getting yeah. all wet. Um, okay, where are the red-throated? Red-throated loons? I assume hummingbird or no? No, which which one? Oh, I'm thinking ruby. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are due back probably soon. Uh, haven't seen one yet. I think they usually arrive a little bit later. Haven't seen a house wren yet. They're a little bit later on the migrants, common birds that we will see pretty soon. And are you saying that a house sparrow is not a sparrow? Well, yeah, it's uh, it technically, it, well, it just depends on what kind of language you're using. For an ornithologist, no, they're called, a, they're finches, they're weaver finches. Yeah. That's their category of birds. They're called house sparrows. They're called sparrows in Europe, in Asia too. Oh, okay. that's, that's what everybody calls them there as well. But they're not the same as the native sparrows of, of the Americas. Not I've sure got a lot of those in my yard and they just are <laughs> like, yeah, I call them like a gang. 
they, they just clean, so many of them and they'll eat all the, the bird seed. They clean out my feeder in about one day. I fill it up. It's not a real big feeder. It takes it quite a bit of seed. It takes them about a day to clean it out. Yes, and they really go to work. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, I'm not seeing uh, anything else other than thank you to us for uh, the fellow guests and us being great panel. I thank everybody for your comments and questions. They were all great. Um, you know, I, I wonder about that. What's the best way to really see the rare and unusual things because I'm in my yard seeing the same thing so often. But I've noticed that in uh, the like last summer, um, if I just sat throughout the day looking out the window, I would see some amazing, surprising single birds showing up like a cat bird or um, there were there were others that I was like, you know, quickly doing a Google search to see if I could describe it well enough. Um, but at any rate, anybody who registered for this event, I will send you those slides so that you can also <laughs> jump online when you see an unusual bird and, you know, get your reference tools at the ready. Because that was the hardest thing for me is I would try to put on all these descriptives and I would do it just in Google images. And sometimes they were a match and sometimes I was still stumped. But you're saying that the Cornell site, the eBird yeah. site is Cornell. Also, for, you, can, you can log in, you can get an account on something called iNaturalist. Oh, yes. And I have not done that, but you can post your pictures up there and people will weigh in to- uh, Nice. Oh, that's great. Identify. And how do you best advise uh, photographing birds? Like, you know, I've seen these monoculars that you can put, you, you can do this like you know, scope and then attach it to your cell phone. Yeah, um, that's probably not gonna be real effective for most birds. You can use, if you've got a spotting scope, you can use a, a cell phone or a, a small camera to take a picture through. But you know, equipment, photography, camera equipment has gotten so much more sophisticated with the digital and, and lightweight stuff that you can get some pretty decent pictures with a relatively inexpensive telephoto camera. But mostly it's like anything else, like seeing the birds, taking the pictures of birds, it's, it's time and patience, 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 keep your eyes open, stay alert, stay out there. And uh, yes, I find like, um, I love to go by uh, Schiller Woods and in that area, there's a lot of, you know, bird calls that you'll hear and you can't find the bird. <laughs> oh yeah. That That's like, why you need to learn the songs and you've got to start exactly. learning the, songs the calls. Yeah. <laughs> so, so even if you don't see it, you know, you heard it. Right. Yeah, oh, that's and great. All well, the songs and calls are just absolutely fascinating of their own right, as well as being great for identification. So, right, exactly. Um, and also, it was also fascinating that you chose to start out with a dragonfly. Or in the beginning of the presentation, you're talking about dragon uh, dragonflies, and I know at Thatcher Woods, it's like really heavy out there. I remember being out there and just seeing so many. And recently, I read that they're like the most successful predator uh, in nature. Like I don't know how you would judge who, I don't know how you would judge who's most successful. But, I know. I was like, what kind but, of crazy statistic is this? But, but dragonflies, all dragonflies are predators of other insects. So right. Yeah, so, but yeah. So so dragonfly migration. Tell me again. Where does it? Where do they migrate? The darners. They said the darners. They said to uh, Mexico and the Caribbean. Wow. Awesome. Well, you're just gold, John. I tell you, I thank you so much for all the information. I know everyone's appreciating it. We're getting a lot of wonderful presentation. Thank you. Informative. Great presentation. Yeah. Um, we go. Uh, oh, here we go. You had mentioned the red throated loon somewhere. If you yeah. don't mind repeating that. Yeah, red throated loons are much less common um, as migrants through this area. Pretty, pretty rare. And the only place I've seen them is on Lake Michigan or, or close to Lake Michigan. But they do show up on inland lakes very, very, very rarely. They look a lot like the common loon. You could get your bird guide out there. Any kind of a good look, they're pretty easy to tell apart. I know people who can just pick them out in flight in an instant. I'm not quite that good. <laughs> but once they're on the ground, on the water, and you can see them, they, they're, they're just enough different in both body shape and plumage to, to separate out. 
Uh, what's your definitive handheld bird guide book? Oh, you know, that's, it's me. I, I can tell you what mine, I'm partial to yeah, yours. Mine is, I'm partial to National Geographic um, guide because, well, there's a various reasons that uh, for beginners, I still like Peterson, the one I started out with. A lot of people recommend the uh, Kaufman guides for beginners or the Sibley guides for beginners. I don't use either. Oh, we lost your mic. Hang on just one second. Sorry, John, we lost your mic with a little glitch. Can you say something now, John, and maybe your mic is back. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, it worked. It's good. What okay. were you, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, I, was just, I was going on about uh, National Geographic Guide, why I like it, as it's got more text, more detailed text. It's got nice range maps, and the, photo, the pictures are good. Yeah, and the maps, the, I bet the, the maps would be good, of yeah. course. And the uh, Peterson, I have guides, one. Peterson Guides have maps as well, so... Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question, wondering why we're seeing red-breasted house finches this year. Haven't noticed them in prior years. Well, I couldn't tell you why you're seeing them now and not before because they've been around. Um, they are also immigrants to this area. They are native uh, North American birds, but not to the Midwest. Ooh. And I first started seeing them about 1985, I think, in this area. But they've been every, I've lived here where I am now for 30 years and there's been house finches here every year. <laughs> so I've been seeing them too. And I'm yeah. by you. Yeah, um, so. yeah, I've been seeing them and I've always like shocked when I see them. I'm like, okay. A lot of people are just paying more attention, which is great. Now, 100%. Because they're home more. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And it's a bonus for everybody. It's a win. Uh, tell us just before we go, Christmas count. What are you talking about? Okay, uh, National Audubon Society is sponsored since uh, 1899. Every Christmas season, um, you go into teams, you can go on National Audubon's website and look this up and get the details. But a team picks out an area that's uh, a five, 15 mile diameter circle. And you get a team together and in one day during the two weeks around Christmas and New Year's, you go out and count as many birds as you can and report them to National Audubon Society. And you can go on National Audubon's website and you can see someone has digitized the entire record of all of those Christmas counts. You can look them up. Fantastic. Um, on a side note, I just have to mention at Addison Library, we have two Canadian geese sitting on, uh, mommy's sitting on the eggs and they're due to hatch mid-April. Um, it's been really cool. We have a green roof, and so they have chosen us. I feel so fortunate, even though the other day when I was walking into the building, they were across the way on the top of the other, uh, on the police station, and I was like, I know that there are tough birds, because he was looking at me like, what are you doing? Are you getting near my babies or something? I thought, you know, oh, geez, don't think I'm trying to get up on that roof, but it's super cool. We've been getting photographs and we actually, I don't know how they got the date of when we expect the hatchlings, but I assume they know when the eggs were laid and we're keeping a close eye here. So it's really cool. And, you know, it's something like Canadian geese are such an ever present um, bird in our area that it's, it's pretty great to have them doing their thing. Yeah. So. All right, John, thank you. Last call for questions. Otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us. And thank really you. Look for, forward to this. And check out, a, I'll do my last pitch for Chicago Audubon. We're welcoming new members of all the time. But if you're in DuPage County, you can look up a more local group for yourself if you'd like. That's good too. <laughs> That's a very, I did the membership. It's very affordable and it's very worthwhile. The, you know, Audubon really does the thing for birds. So. Definitely, they need your support for whatever, you know, in whatever way you can. Um, I will be forwarding, as I mentioned in the chat, anything I get from John for slides, I'm going to send it to everybody who registered. And if you want to shoot me your email, if you didn't register and somehow got the link, just go ahead and shoot me a, a chat right now in private or whatever. Um, but yeah, you're welcome to. And John, whenever, at your convenience, if you could send that along.
So if I don't do it tomorrow, I forget. So if you don't get I totally get it. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you again. We'll see you all soon.